Thank you. <clears throat> I'm going to start quietly because I don't want to disturb my great nephew, Roger. He's just outside, out in the woods. It rained last night and he loves the woods when they're rain drenched. There's a wooded path out there, carpeted with lichens. It makes a silvery gray strip through the woods like an old fashioned hall runner. Several years ago, Roger started noticing how they change with the rain. In dry weather, they are thin and brittle. They crumble under your feet, but they soak up rain like a sponge and they become deep and springy. He likes to run. Oh, I miss being out there with Roger. I used to wake him up early in the morning and take him down to the shore to enjoy the low tide, those marvelous odors of seaweed and fish, of tides rising and falling in rhythm, the smell of mud drying on the rocks. <laughs> Sometimes I used to wake him up late at night. We would take our flashlights down there. If you roll up your pants and you walk out onto the big rocks, you can see big scurrying crabs, starfish, anemones. <laughs> Roger, Roger is the son of my niece. When she passed away in 1957, he was all alone. So of course, my mother and I took him in. I have been bringing him here every summer to introduce him to the wonders of nature. A child's world is fresh and new and beautiful, full of wonder and excitement. It is our misfortune that those feelings get dimmer and even disappear before we even reach adulthood. So it's important to teach him. This summer, I've been introducing him to bird watching. I told him, you have to get up very early before the sun even rises. Dress in quiet, dark clothing, nothing that rustles. Stand with your back to the rising sun so you can really see the birds. Be as still and as quiet as possible. And when a bird appears, don't take your eyes off of it. Try to notice as many details as possible. It takes practice to notice them quickly and focus on them, so don't give up. You can use binoculars to see them better, but it takes a long time to use them rightly. Oh, I would like so much to someday do a book about the importance of nurturing a sense of wonder in children that other adults could use with their children. But, of course, even if I were healthy, I would still be indoors this summer, not to write, but to prepare. I have been asked to address the Senate subcommittee tasked with reviewing all federal legislation pertaining to pesticides and other chemical pollutants. This is what happens when you write a firestorm of a book. Silent Spring. It came out in September of 62, and the critical reaction was, as we expected, quite the firestorm. I'm still getting criticisms. One just arrived in the mail this morning, so I brought it to share with you. <clears throat> If mankind were to follow the teachings of Miss Carson, we would return to the Dark Ages and insects and disease and vermin would once again inherit the earth. <laughs> I shall add this one to my pile of criticisms. <laughs> Nearly one hundred thousand dollars has been spent to attack the book and its hysterical author. <laughs> Is it any wonder I don't want to return home to Maryland and face the storm? <laughs> but it has all been worthwhile because people are waking up. 
A group of people in Long Island recently voted to cancel aerial spraying of their beautiful island with pesticides. Change is happening. This is good. Complacency is a dangerous state. A sense of personal responsibility is desperately needed. President Kennedy recently asked his Senate Science Advisory Committee to investigate the impact of pesticides and other chemical pollutants on humans and the environment. This could mean some new legislation is coming down the road. So my task this summer is to prepare what I'm going to say to them. So I've been working on it. See what you think. Hmm? <clears throat> People say these pesticides wouldn't be for sale if they weren't safe. That simply isn't true. Trusting so-called authority is not enough. Personal responsibility, that's desperately needed. My recommendation is not the elimination of chemical pesticides, but rather moderation in their use. I recommend stronger pesticide warnings, and I recommend a cabinet-level agency to regulate pesticides and other chemical pollutants. And it must be an independent agency, not under the jurisdiction of the chemical companies. <laughs> It's all there, it's all true, but I haven't quite got it yet. Isn't it funny where life takes you? I certainly never intended that I would become an expert on chemical pesticides. I never even intended to become a scientist. It often surprises people to learn that I, a marine biologist, author of three books about the sea and her creatures, grew up far from the ocean, never even saw the ocean in my own childhood. But it's true. It was not until the summer after I graduated from college that I first saw much water beyond the streams that meander around Springdale, the little town near Pittsburgh where I grew up. But. I had a mother who introduced me at an early age to the wonders of nature. She would take me on long walks in the woods. Together we would learn the names of every tree and shrub and flower that we found. I was, she said, very different from my older brother and sister, Robert and Marion. I was, she was sure born for something special. My mother was always the greatest influence on my life. She was the type who would not even kill an insect that wandered into our house. She introduced me to nature and literature and music. Only very reluctantly would she cook the rabbits that Robert brought home from hunting. <laughs> One day, I was digging in our yard, and I found the most unusual rock, sort of imprinted with lines. So I brought it to my mother, and I said to her, what is it? She said to me, let's find out together, and took a book off the shelf. It was a fossil, we discovered, of a fish that had lived in this area millions of years before. Imagine, once upon a time, oh, millions of years ago, an ocean flowed all over and around Pittsburgh, covering its land with this cool, dark water, before gradually, over many years, slowly pulling back to that far distant shore where it sits today. <laughs> I don't remember a time in my life when I didn't imagine I was going to be a writer. I don't know why. There were no writers in my family. I just thought it would be fun to tell stories. 
Funny though, it never occurred to me to become a scientist. I never even took a science class, not until college. And then, only because all the girls at the Pennsylvania College for Women had to take science. Our teacher was Miss Skinker. I said to her one day, Miss Skinker, I can't get this slide to focus. Oh, that knob, all right. Now, what am I looking for? <gasps> Wait, there it is. It's transparent, right? It's a sort of oval floating across. It looks like a cloud floating across the sky or a raindrop slowly making its way down a pane of glass. In that one tiny single-celled organism she showed me, I could see the whole complexity of the universe captured under glass. Thanks to Miss Skinker, I abandoned writing and I changed my major to biology. I spent two summers at the Woods Hole Institute and then got my master's degree in zoology from the Johns Hopkins University. I thought I had abandoned writing forever. Never occurred to me I was just getting something to write about. Now, it would be nice to tell you all that this was it. I got my degree and I became a scientist. But this was the 1930s. Money was scarce. I was fortunate to get any job. My family never had much money. My father would meander from one job to the next, never staying in any job for long. He died when I was in my 20s. Robert and Marion both moved back in with us, Marion with two small children. The only one there was to support all of us was me. I was very fortunate to be hired as a writer for the U.S. Fisheries Bureau, hardly a scientist, but it was a job. <laughs> one day, my boss at the Fisheries Bureau asked if I would help with these radio scripts. They were doing these short radio programs all about marine life. Seven minute fish tales, they were called. <laughs> Except the scientists weren't having much luck with the writing and the writers they hired didn't have the science background, so would I try it? I remember coming into my boss's office one day and saying, um, I have this radio script you asked about, but I'm afraid I rather took charge of the situation. He read it over, called me back in and said, I don't think this will do for us, Miss Carson. You better try again. But this one, Miss Carson, you should send this one to the Atlantic. It's too good for us. So I became a writer and an editor. During the day, I wrote pamphlets, information for the public about sea creatures and various coastal reserves. And in my free time, in the evenings and the weekends, I wrote articles for Reader's Digest or the Baltimore Sun. It'll be shad time soon. They brought in $10, $15 each, and we always needed that money. My first book was written about the ocean from the perspective of the creatures who live in and around the water, under the sea wind. I will never forget mailing off the manuscript carefully typed up by my mother. The book appeared in November 1941, one month before the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. The world received my first book with superb indifference. <laughs> But I was so driven to keep writing about the sea. There is something infinitely fascinating to me about water in terms of the chains of life it supports. Start 
with the tiny drifting cells of green plankton. A water flea eats these, small fish strain them from the water, larger fish eat them, mammals, mink, raccoon eat them. It is an endless cyclical transfer of material from life to life. So I began another book. This one was to be a sort of biography of the world's oceans. Not perhaps very humble of me, but the sea is so full of mysteries. Great white shark lives there, 2,000 pound killer of the sea, and the 400 foot blue whale, largest creature known on earth. And it is also home to creatures so infinitesimally tiny that you can scoop into your two hands as many of them as there are stars in the Milky Way. One day, while I was researching the sea around us, Roger and I found a starfish in the morning that I brought home to study. That night, when the tide was in, I said to him, we must take it back to where we took it from. Each creature must be returned to its own habitat. Every creature is a link in the vast chain of life. <laughs> that book, The Sea Around Us, The Sea Around Us was on the New York Times bestseller list for 86 weeks. Hmm? And it was number one for 32 weeks. Now, many people have expressed their surprise that a book about science could have so many popular sales. Science, as if science were the prerogative of a small group of men in white coats hidden in labs. Science belongs to everyone. The realities of science are the realities of life. The beauty and wonder of the world belongs to everyone. Thanks to this success, I was able to leave government work, become a full-time writer, a dream fulfilled. Of course, fame has a downside. I was pestered by people everywhere I went. One day, I was at the hairdresser's, my inviolate sanctuary. As I was sitting there under the hairdryer, the salon owner came over, snapped off the hairdryer to say, an admirer was here and simply had to speak with me at that moment. <laughs> mm. I don't know what I'm going to do about Roger. I haven't told him yet about the cancer. I've been so busy, there hasn't really been time, and I can't seem to find the right words. It was while I was researching the sea around us that I first discovered a lump in my breast. It was removed. Nothing more needs to be done, the doctor said, so nothing was. Oh, I do wish I had not trusted him. <laughs> but after the sea around us, people also began writing, asking for help. My friend, Olga Hickens, wrote to me. She owns a small bird sanctuary. One day, she said, an airplane appeared over her land, spewing clouds of this thick, swirling white fog. Dichloro, diphenol, trichloroethane, DDT. It was to kill the mosquitoes, which it did. It killed the mosquitoes and all the other insects and the birds. 
One day she came upon seven dead birds, their claws drawn up to their breasts in agony. What could be done, she wanted to know. Who should she write to in Washington? How do we spread the word about these senseless killings? I immediately began to collect information about the new chemical pesticides. And the more I collected, the more appalled I became. In 1955, some 200 acres of salt marsh in eastern Florida were treated with dieldrin, one of the other new chemicals, in hopes of getting rid of the, the sand fly larva. They used one pound of dieldrin per acre. The impact on life in that marsh was catastrophic. Dead fish were strewn on the shoreline. Sharks moved in, attracted by the dead and dying fish. An entire crab population virtually annihilated. And another example, fire ants, long considered little more than a minor stinging nuisance, were suddenly the target of a barrage of pesticide manufacturer propaganda. No longer a minor stinging nuisance, they were suddenly a serious threat to southern agriculture. A mighty campaign began to treat some 20 million acres in nine southern states for fire ants. The sales bonanza for the pesticide manufacturers. They used dieldrin and heptachlor, both new chemicals. Few field studies had been done on either one. No one really knew what the impact would be on humans and the environment. What was known was that both were many times more toxic than DDT. The result? Losses running all the way up to complete destruction of wildlife in some places. Livestock, poultry, pets, all killed. In one Texas county, a large population of armadillos and raccoons disappeared. No species was spared. When researchers examined the bodies of dead birds, they found high levels of the fire ant poisons. And it's not difficult to see why. Woodcocks, which winter in Louisiana, eat earthworms, digging for them in the ground with their long bills. Surviving earthworms in Louisiana had high concentrations of heptachlor. Now, my friend Dorothy, she warned me she said, the chemical companies will hate you. They are rich and powerful. They will do anything to turn people against you. I know, I know, I said. But there would be no peace for me if I kept quiet. I could never again listen to a cardinal song in peace. But what to do and how? I was a marine biologist, not an expert on pesticides. I began writing to every scientist I knew, begging them to take up the cause. E.B. White would have been marvelous at capturing not only the danger, but the beauty under threat. None of them would take it on. So I began to realize I would have to write this book myself, and it would have to be a book. Chemical companies advertise too heavily in magazines. So, to begin, a blank sheet of paper, an empty page, the beginning. Words, 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 words. In nature, nothing exists alone. No, 
Mm. The more I have learned about chemical pesticides, the more appalled I have become. No. I'm a perfectionist when it comes to writing. I agonize over each sentence, revising paragraph by painstaking paragraph. Writing is, at best, a lonely occupation. During the actual work of creation, you shut yourself off from the world and you face your subject all alone. I wonder what is in this water, <laughs> besides water. <laughs> what was it that Tennyson said once? A mighty wind arises, roaring seaward, and I go. Once upon a time. There was a little town where humans and nature lived in harmony. The town was surrounded by farms, golden fields heavy with grain, and hillsides covered with fruit trees that in spring bore sweetly scented white blossoms. In autumn, the maple and oak trees created vivid colors that blazed against the green pines. At night, you could hear foxes barking in the woods and deer rustling softly through them. Even in winter, the roadsides looked beautiful, lined with dried weeds poking out of snowbanks that birds would come to feed upon. So many birds lived in this area. People would come from miles around just to enjoy their beautiful colors and soft songs. Then, something evil arrived. Strange illnesses caused chickens and sheep to die. Farmers began to whisper about strange illnesses in their families. Doctors couldn't explain what had caused several sudden, unexpected deaths. Several children fell ill while playing and died. Hours later. And it was all suddenly so quiet. Where were the birds? The bird feeders were deserted. The mornings, which had been filled with the sounds of robins and jays and wrens, there was now suddenly no sound, just silence all across the houses and lawns and woods. Across this town, Nestled among roof shingles and along window sills, you could still see traces of a white powder. Several weeks earlier, it had fallen like snow all across the fields and houses and woods. No war had swept across this area. No witches had put a curse on life here. The people had done it to themselves. So, what town am I describing? It could be any of a thousand towns in America. None of them has seen all of these misfortunes. But every one of these tragedies has happened somewhere. And many towns have seen many of them. An ominous presence has quietly appeared among us. This imaginary disaster could easily become reality for all of us. <sighs> that was it. That was how Silent Spring would begin. You know, we didn't always call it that. My editor at first suggested we call it at war with nature. <laughs> Perhaps a bit too belligerent, I said. Well, how about man against the earth? Or dissent in favor of man? 
We tried so many titles. My literary agent, Marie Rodell, finally said, we were just going to have to call it Rachel Carson's next book. <laughs> but then she told me to reread that first chapter about the spring with no birds. And that was it, Silent Spring. I signed a contract with Houghton Mifflin. They asked, could I deliver the manuscript in seven months? I said, yes, yes, of course. Two and a half years later, I was still researching. <laughs> there was so much to learn. Here's another example. Our national symbol, the bald eagle, whose numbers have been declining at an alarming rate. Something is happening in the bird's environment that is affecting their ability to reproduce. What is it? No one knows. But many signs point to chemical pesticides. An ornithologist living on the western coast of Florida found and banded about a thousand young eagles between 1939 and 1949. He would band them as young birds before they even left the nest. And later, when he recovered the banded birds, he discovered they had traveled north as far as Canada before returning to the south in the winter. In his early years, he might find a hundred active nests. He might band up to 125 young birds. But starting around 1947, the numbers of young birds began to decline. Some nests had no eggs. Some had eggs that had not hatched. In 1955, he searched a hundred miles of coastline before finding and banding one young eaglet. And other observers confirm this trend so strongly, it may be necessary for us to find a new national symbol over and over over, we hear the same reports. Occupancy of some nests by adult birds, some eggs appearing, but very few young birds, or none at all. Something is affecting the bird's reproductive capacity so extremely, there are almost no yearly additions of young birds to maintain the species. And other places have also seen shocking numbers of bird deaths. In England, huge numbers of birds died after eating seeds treated with pesticides. And not only birds died, but foxes as well. And foxes are necessary to keep down the rabbit population. It is not difficult to see why wild birds are valuable as members of the ecology in which we all live. Here is what I would like to know. Who has placed in one pad of the scales the leaves that might have been eaten by insects, and in the other pan the pitiful heaps of multi-hued feathers, lifeless remains of birds that died before the unselective bludgeon of insecticidal poisons. <sighs> well, now, you might say I should have footnoted everything in my book. But this is a book that has to persuade as well as inform. My contributions to scientific facts are not nearly as important as my ability to awaken feelings about the world of nature. But still, I do not expect anyone to take my word for it. This book sits on an unshakable scientific foundation that's terribly important. In the back, 55 pages of references. I never would have included notes if I were hoping to distort or conceal or to present half-truths. <laughs> In the end, it took me four years to write Silent Spring. Difficult, painful years. As I was writing it, my personal life 
fell apart. My mother died. I was holding her hand to the very end. That was catastrophic. Sometimes arthritis caused my hands to cramp up so badly I could not even hold a pen. The cancer returned, requiring a double mastectomy in 1960, but I pushed on. The New Yorker published the first of two excerpts from Silent Spring in June of 62. They received more mail about the Silent Spring excerpts than they had ever received about any article. And in September, the book itself appeared. And almost immediately, the criticisms began to arrive. <clears throat> Isn't it just like a woman to be scared to death of a few little bugs? <laughs> this book is part of a communist conspiracy to destroy the agriculture and economy of these United States. And this one, from a member of the Federal Pest Control Board, notes that I am a spinster and asks, so what is she so concerned about genetics for? <laughs> and this one, which might very well be my favorite, no one at any county farm bureau office who was spoken with today had read the book, but all disapproved of it extremely. <laughs> <laughs> when CBS asked me to appear on one of their television programs and talk about Silent Spring, three advertisers pulled their sponsorship from the program. Still, the positive reviews, the positive response far outnumbers the negative ones. I have learned to face both sides calmly, even though sometimes I feel like a, like a tiny transparent ghost crab, alone on a sandy beach, facing the roaring surf. <laughs> Silent Spring sold 100,000 copies in its first four months. People must be feeling something to react that way. So perhaps, as I prepare for this congressional address, perhaps what I ought to do really is to read a bit of Silent Spring. <clears throat> These sprays, dusts, and aerosols are now applied almost universally to farms, gardens, forests, and homes. Non-selective chemicals that have the power to kill every insect, the good and the bad, to still the song of birds and the leaping of fish in the streams, to coat the leaves with a deadly film, and to linger on in the soil. All this, although the intended target may be only a few weeds or insects. People talk about control of nature, but man, is a part of nature. What we do to nature, we do to ourselves. The war on nature is a war on ourselves. <clears throat> Can anyone believe that it is possible to lay down such a barrage of poisons on the face of the earth without making it unsuitable for all life? They should not be called insecticides, but biocides. Okay. Question now is whether to mention my own illness, this cancer eating away at me. No. No, it cannot be mentioned. I wrote a great deal in Silent Spring about the impact of pesticides on cancer. I do not want anyone saying that I have a vendetta because of a personal problem. I would like to inspire feelings in these senators, but not about me, about nature. 
I truly believe it is not half so important to know as it is to feel. Once, when Roger was just an infant, I wrapped him up in a blanket and I took him down to the shoreline here in a rainstorm. I held him tight way out there, just at the edge of where we couldn't see. Big waves were thundering in, these dimly seen white shapes that boomed and shouted and threw great handfuls of white foam at us. Together, he and I laughed for sheer joy. He, an infant, meeting for the first time that wild tumult of the sea. And I, with the lifetime of sea love in me, I was rediscovering with him the wonder and excitement of the world in which we live. Once you are aware of the wonder of nature, you will want to know more about it. Oh, I would like so much to do that nature book. That would be heaven to achieve. There is so much I still want to do. It is, it is hard to accept that in all probability, I will have to leave most of it undone. No, no, my life has been rich. I've had rewards and satisfactions few people achieve. If it must end soon, I have achieved most of what I wanted to achieve. I have lived to see the publication of this book. That is good. It is good to know I will live on, even for people who will never meet me. Mostly, it is good to know I will live on through association with something beautiful and lovely. Well, if all of you will excuse me, I really should go lie down. This sort of thing exhausts me lately. But I would like to leave all of you with a challenge. I would like to challenge each of you, the next time you are outdoors, the next time you are in nature, take a moment and really notice the earth around you. Notice the ebb and the flow of the winds, the smell of the earth, the tiny folded bud ready for spring. I find it so healing, that repetition of nature, the knowledge that spring always comes after winter, that daytime always follows night. And if a bird appears, watch it until it lands on a branch or even just on the railing of your city apartment balcony and ask yourself this, what if I had never seen this before? What if I knew I would never see this again? Those who contemplate the beauty of the earth find reserves of strength that will endure as long as life lasts. I truly believe that the more clearly we can focus our attention on the beauty and the wonder of the world around us, the less taste we will have for its destruction. If I can just convey that to those senators, that will be enough. It is everything. Thank you all so much for listening today, and good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, before we finish up, what questions do you have? Yes. The Sea Around Us was published in 1951, so exactly 10 years after Under the Sea Wind. 
And then I had another book, which came out in 1955, that was The Edge of the Sea, all about the life that lives at that wonderful edge area between the sea and the land. So all together, I have written four books, three about the sea and one about chemical pollutants. Yes? When did you die? When did I die? Well, I haven't died yet, have I? <laughs> to answer that question, here's what I'm going to do, if you don't mind. I'm going to put down the cane, and I'm going to um, go back to uh, Leslie Goddard. Um, so I'm no longer Rachel Carson. I'll resume my identity as Leslie, so I can tell you sort of the rest of the story. Uh, Rachel Carson published her great masterpiece, Silent Spring, that was in 1962. She passed away in April of 1964 at the age of 56. She was very, very young. And the amazing thing always I find about Silent Spring is that she was so sick when she wrote it, not only suffering with cancer, which is bad enough, but a host of other um, horrible things, you know, eyes diseases that left her blind for a temporary period of time, terrible rheumatoid arthritis, um, bone thinning, she could hardly stand. So after Silent Spring came out, everybody wanted to, you know, invite her, come and give a talk, join our organization. She accepted almost none of them because she was so ill. But she did live to deliver um, uh, t addresses to two different Senate subcommittees. So she did live to see that, and she lived to see President Kennedy's Science Advisory Committee publish its results, which really vindicated everything she had said in Silent Spring. Yeah. So it was pretty amazing. But she did not live to see the great flourishing of the modern environmental movement in the late 1960s, including not just the, the Clean Air Act in 1970 and the, was that right? Yeah, the Clean Water Act in 72, um, the establishment of the EPA in 1970, which she had fought for, and Earth Day in, 19, or, you know, in April 22, 1970. She did not live to see the, the banning of DDT in 1972, but it all happened. Um, she was not the only environmentalist. A lot of times people say, you know, Rachel Carson existed and then we had an environmental movement. Um, there were many, many people concerned about the environment in the post-World War II era, but Rachel Carson stirred the pot more and better than anybody else. Um, she got the discussion to be something you could not avoid. And that really pushed it forward. Mm -hmm. you, um, in your list, you have the, the American Experience um, show that, that has been shown. Yes. Um, it, yes. The point is about the American Experience program. American Experience did a wonderful program on Rachel Carson. Um, the first one was in 2007, and it's been um, slightly revised and reissued. I don't know if it was when it was, I'm sure it was propaganda for DDT or something like that. Yeah. And so the, this truck is going down the street. Yes. Stuff and children are running after it. Oh, I agree. Does anyone remember in this, in this video, there are scenes of the trucks, DDT trucks going down the streets with all this. Does anyone remember these? And the kids would go running after it, you know, like, let's play. Were you one of those kids? Yes, exactly. And they show, you know, like kids at picnic tables and they're spraying them with DDT because look, it's perfectly harmless. Um, it's, it's powerful to see that stuff today. Mm -hmm. Some years ago, I was in Guatemala going down the road and saw exactly the same kind of thing. Somebody was out there spraying along and the kids were following along, planting mm -hmm. stuff. They were planting? Wow. Just recently, she was in Guatemala. Well, recent, yeah. Recent, maybe. 25 years ago? Well, that's more recently than 40 years ago. She was in Guatemala and saw the trucks going down the streets with DDT. A, a oh, it was a person with a spray thing? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's one of the amazing things so often when chemical companies say these, these things are perfectly safe for humans, you know, the instinct is great. 
hey, what could be better? Um, and one of Rachel Carson's, I think, great advances is that she said, okay, first of all, these chemicals have not been around long enough for us to really be able to say they are not harmful to humans. And second of all, even if they're not harmful to humans in the short term, they're harmful to the good insects, to the birds, to the wildlife, to the trees, to the earthworms, to all the things we depend upon for our earth. And that, that was a big mindset shift for a lot of Americans. Yeah. Yeah. What happened to Roger? Roger is still alive. Um, Roger actually lives today in Massachusetts. He runs a video production company. But the best part about it is, in fact, I think he appears on that American Experience special. They interview him about his memories of Rachel. Uh, he was born in 52, so he's not that old. He's in his 60s. Um, he still owns Rachel Carson's cottage in Maine. And it's very small, but if you're ever up in Southport, it's about an hour from Portland, Maine. Um, you can rent her cottage. It rents by the week in the summertime. It's very simple, but it's really amazing that it's still there. Um, also, Rachel Carson's childhood home is a museum. It's open like Saturdays in the summer. Her house in Silver Spring, Maryland, which is where she wrote Silent Spring, is run by the Rachel Carson Council. It's not open for tours, but the Rachel Carson Council is the group that really keeps alive the fight for many of these issues that Rachel Carson held uh, so dearly. So kind of the best tribute to her is that these groups continuing the fight in her name. And I also recommend Rachel Carson's fifth book. A year after she died, some of Rachel Carson's friends took a newspaper article she had written called A Sense of Wonder, and it was all about how you can introduce your child to a sense of wonder, and they published it as a book. The book is called A Sense of Wonder. They interspersed her text with beautiful photographs, not of Roger, although it looks like it's Roger, but of um, children. Um, so it's been reissued, actually, just recently, within the last 10, maybe 15 years, as a small paperback book. So if you're ever looking, if you have friends who have children, or if you become a grandparent and need a good book, it's wonderful. And I think it's, as much as I think you, you, Silent Spring is, is essential to understand Rachel Carson, to really get at the heart of what she thought was most important as a legacy about nurturing this joy of nature, Sense of Wonder captures it, um, I think, better than any of the others. So, Thank you all so much for coming today. Thank you.